Ukraine isn't the only problem. America has to worry about China too. When Biden took over the White House, he pledged to manage America's differences with China. But this approach has proved to be challenging. Tensions have escalated in recent years, dangerous military encounters have increased, and communication channels have remained frozen. Until now, US and China now want to talk. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is all set to visit China this month. It is an attempt to stabilize the relationship. But before Blinken sits down to talk, the U.S. and its allies are facing fresh provocations from the PLA. Our next report brings you the details. A close call in the South China Sea. and a near miss in the Taiwan Strait. Tensions between the US and China are at an all-time high, and these close encounters are only raising the stakes. Today, there was yet another provocation from the PLA. This time, the target was South Korea. Chinese and Russian aircraft made aggressive moves. They entered South Korea's Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIZ. This is like a border in the skies. When you enter this area, you need to identify yourself. Otherwise, any plane can be considered as hostile. But Chinese and Russian jets went in unannounced. Beijing said they were on a joint patrol. But for Seoul, the move was a provocation. In response, they scrambled their own jets. Diplomatic protest followed. The South Koreans say such flights can cause tensions in the region. They are not the only ones who are complaining. Earlier this week, Japan was targeted too. Russian and Chinese bomber planes showed up in the Sea of Japan. These planes flew together till the East China Sea, where two more Chinese fighter jets joined the formation. Just like its neighbor, Japan too scrambled its jets in response. Why are the hostilities rising? The actions of China and Russia coincide with military exercises in the region. The U.S. and its allies have been doing drills in the Indo-Pacific. Countries like South Korea, Japan and the Philippines have participated with large contingents. That's not all. The U.S. has stepped up its deployments in the region too. The expanded presence is supposed to be a deterrence. Instead, they're leading to more close calls. Recently, the U.S. Defense Secretary admitted these encounters could lead to dangerous outcomes provocative intercepts of our, our aircraft and, and also our allies' aircraft. Uh, that's very concerning, and we would hope that uh, they would alter their, their, uh, their actions. Uh, but since they haven't yet, I'm concerned about, uh, at some point, uh, having an incident that could very, very quickly spiral out of control. Washington has been seeking a dialogue with Beijing. For weeks, China was reluctant, but recently it had a change of heart there has been a flurry of high-level contacts. First, CIA Director Bill Burns visited Beijing. A secret visit happened in May at China's invitation. Then, the U.S. National Security Advisor met with Wang Yi, China's top foreign policy official. They met in Vienna for two days. Then this week, there was another meeting. Two senior American officials met with their counterparts in Beijing. The talks seemed to have paved the way for another high-level meeting. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will now visit China. But ahead of Blinken's arrival... The truth is that the U.S. warships and jets traveled all the way to China's doorstep to provoke, insisting on conducting close-in reconnaissance near the airspace and territorial waters of China and flexing their military muscles. This is not safeguarding freedom of navigation, but promoting navigation hegemony. It is a blatant military provocation, which is the root cause of maritime and air security risks. And that's the major flashpoint, the growing military developments and the lack of communication channels between the two armed forces. The military-level dialogue is yet to be revived. And without that, the risk of a dangerous escalation will continue to remain high. Speaking of the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he's in Saudi Arabia on a three-day visit one that promises to be a challenge for him. 
On Tuesday, Blinken met Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The talks covered a range of issues like security, economy, terrorism and the war in Yemen. But one line from the US statement stands out. Let me read that out. The Secretary also emphasized that our bilateral relationship is strengthened by progress on human rights. That's important to note. Joe Biden campaigned by promising a tough line on Riyadh. He vowed to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state. But three years later, he's backtracking. There are three reasons why. One, he needs Saudi support to control oil prices. This weekend, the kingdom slashed supply by one million barrels. It's not good news for American inflation. Two, he needs to contain Chinese influence. Saudi Arabia has been cozying up to China. They even let Beijing broker a normalization deal with Iran. So what does Biden do? He tries to mend fences with Riyadh. And number three, he needs Saudi Arabia to recognize Israel. Symbolically, it would mean a coup for Biden. But politically too, it's important. An axis between Israel and Arab states will be a bulwark against Iran. It would extend American influence. The only question is, will MBS play along? The truth is, he's spoiled for choice. He's got China in his corner. He's got Russia working with him in OPEC+. Plus, and now the US is courting him. So what does he do? Right now, it looks like he's not picking any side. Just think back to the last century. West Asia was a pawn in great power rivalries. And what did they get in return? War and instability. So now there seems to be a realization, an understanding that regional issues must be solved regionally. There's no point betting on big powers. Look at all the recent events. Iran has reopened its embassy in Saudi Arabia. It was closed seven years ago in 2016. Since then, Riyadh and Tehran were locked in a cold war. They backed opposing sides in the conflict between Yemen and Syria. But now they're mending fences. Their foreign ministers met in Cape Town last Friday. Iran said good progress was made in bilateral ties. Another development was reported on Saturday. Iran announced the creation of a new naval alliance. Guess who's on board? Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It would have been unthinkable a few years ago. The alliance also includes Bahrain, Qatar, Iraq, Pakistan and India. We don't know what shape it will take, but Iran says the objective is regional security. The timing of this decision is important. Just days ago, the UAE walked out of a US-led maritime coalition. So the message is loud and clear. America's space and authority in West Asia is shrinking. What does that mean for the region? Also for stakeholders like India? Well, shrinking doesn't mean disappearing. The US is still the chief weapons supplier in the region. That won't be changing overnight. So the talk of West Asia picking China over the US is premature. But there's a more realistic assessment, a multipolar West Asia. That should be India's goal as well. If West Asia becomes beholden to China, it's not good news. Much of India's energy comes from there. Plus, there is a sizable Indian population living in the Gulf. So more engagement is key, whether bilaterally or through groups like the I2U2. As for Antony Blinken, he's got his work cut out. The US has very little leverage over MBS. Weapons is the only carrot Biden can dangle. But Democrats back home won't be happy. Staying with West Asia, let's look at something else making news in Iran. Tehran says it has developed a hypersonic missile. The missile named Fatah was unveiled yesterday. The unveiling ceremony was attended by Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi. Also present were senior commanders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Why the grand event? Because a hypersonic missile marks a new milestone in Iran's missile program. A missile is considered hypersonic when it can travel at least five times the speed of sound. That makes it a problem for most missile defense systems. The new Fatah missile can allegedly travel at 15 times the speed of sound. If it isn't an exaggeration, that would be quite a feat. Iran says the Fatah hypersonic missile is a crucial deterrent. Here's our report. Iran, 
the Shiite hegemon in West Asia, Saudi Arabia's rival for dominance, Israel's existential threat, and America's perpetual headache in what it calls the Middle East. Tehran has caused a stir yet again. It has unveiled a powerful new weapon. This is the Fatah hypersonic missile. It was introduced with great fanfare on Tuesday. Top Iranian officials were invited to the show, from President Ibrahim Raisi to the commanders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And the center stage was reserved for the Iranian military's latest toy, the Fatah hypersonic missile. Iran says it's a game changer. We are able to precisely hit any target within the range of 1400 kilometers and there exists no system that can rival or counter this missile. That is General Amir Ali Hajizadeh, the commander of the Revolutionary Guard Aerospace Division. His department developed the Fatah missile. He says it can reach speeds between 13 to 15 times the speed of sound. That's Mark 13 to Mark 15 in technical terms. It's quite an achievement. To qualify as hypersonic, a missile just needs to be five times faster than the speed of sound or Mark 5. The Fatah can supposedly reach three times that speed. Impressive, if true. Then there's General Hajizadeh's other boast. He says there exists no system that can rival or counter the Fatah missile. Was that just grandstanding? Two missile defense systems in West Asia may have been on the general's mind when he made this claim. The U.S. Patriot system and Israel's Iron Dome. Both are famously effective. Both are used by Iran's rivals. Now, Iran says nothing can counter its attacks. So, is Tehran trying to drum up tensions to provoke a new conflict? Well, Iran says this will boost its deterrence power and help maintain peace. Today we feel that the deterrent power has been formed. This power is an anchor of lasting security and peace for the regional countries. Deterrence isn't a new concept, of course. Everyone relies on it. The concept is simple. Make the enemy think it isn't worth attacking you due to the potential casualties. All countries, especially the nuclear-armed ones, employ this thinking. But while the new missile may dissuade a military attack, Iran's enemies have already responded with hostile moves of a different kind. More sanctions. As soon as Iran went public with the Fatah missile yesterday, the US went to work. Yesterday itself, Washington imposed over a dozen new sanctions. They targeted people and entities in Iran, China and Hong Kong. Why China and Hong Kong? The U.S. believes that firms in China and Hong Kong are helping Iran's military ambitions. One of the people sanctioned is Iran's defense attaché in Beijing, Davud Damghani. The U.S. says he helped procure parts and technology for key actors in Iran's ballistic missile development. And it doesn't seem far-fetched. China has been developing hypersonic missiles for a while now. Beijing's hypersonic program is ahead of Washington's. It's very possible that it helped out a fellow U.S. rival. Now, the question is, what next? Will this new Iranian weapon spur the U.S. into ramping up its own hypersonic program? Will Israel enter the hypersonic arms race? What about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states? The only thing that's certain is that tensions in West Asia aren't dying down any time soon. Let's talk about Memphis. This is a city in the US and these days one of its busiest places is not a cafe or a monument. It is an impound lot where two truck drivers wait for hours on end as they make one drop off after another. And victims too have to wait but for days or even weeks to get their stolen cars back. In this impound lot, thousands of cars have been squeezed in a tight space and most of them are stolen. All thanks to the grand auto theft. No, not the video game. A real life auto theft, which ironically has been inspired by something virtual. TikTok videos. Yes, TikTok, the social media app, has given birth to an explosion of auto thefts. And they are taking over US cities like New York, Baltimore, Cleveland, Milwaukee, San Diego and Seattle. And the target of these thefts are mainly two manufacturers, two South Korean automakers who have proven to be especially vulnerable to this theft. 
and I am talking about Kia and Hyundai. Let us look at some numbers. About 11,000 cars were stolen in Memphis last year. That is twice as many as in 2021. And roughly a third of them were late model Kias and Hyundais. New York reported 977 thefts in the first four months this year. That is up from 148 in the same period in 2022. And the number of stolen Hyundais and Kias have doubled since last year. Hyundai and Kia thefts increased by 767% in Chicago last year and 61% of vehicles stolen in St. Louis in the last year are Kias and Hyundais. You got the drift and so do these cities. So now they have sued these two car makers. They have had enough and they are taking the car makers to court over negligence and selling vehicles that are too easy to steal. These cities have faulted the automaker's failure. What are we talking about? Between 2011 and 2022, Kia and Hyundai have promised to do something they did not. They were supposed to install anti-theft devices called immobilizers in their cars. As many as 8.3 million US vehicles need these immobilizers. But they weren't updated. And the result? Auto theft within seconds. Crime sprees, public harm, even reckless driving. People don't need any sophisticated tech to steal cars. All that's required is a TikTok app and a quick search on how to steal a car. In a matter of seconds, tens of thousands of videos line up. They even have their own hashtag and they provide tips on vehicle theft. They tell you it doesn't take much. All you need is a screwdriver, a USB cord and a hot wiring know-how. Simple, right? Apparently so, and let me be clear, in no way am I encouraging you to steal a car or sharing hot tips with you. I am telling you just what the world has come to and how appalling this is. Because do you know who these videos target? Who end up as culprits of auto theft? Teenagers or young adults? Taking the example of Memphis again, more than half of the 175 people arrested this year were teenagers. And this is just one example of many. But why are teens stealing these cars? Experts say mainly for kicks and viral views, but also for other crimes like robberies and car crashes. So the damage is not just cars. Several teens have died or been seriously hurt because of this, let alone the harm this brings to the victims, yet brimming with auto theft knowledge, coupled with newfound TikTok-inspired confidence, these teens are going after Kia and Hyundai cars, which have become quite the sweet spot due to their failures. But also because of their popularity. The two Korean car brands accounted for about a tenth of US auto sales last year. Except now, they seem to be even more popular for wrong reasons. And now they are clearly under fire. But this isn't new. Last month, the automakers reached a $200 million settlement in a consumer class action. That covered about 9 million vehicle owners in the US. But even so, the biggest battle these car makers face is not against these lawsuits, but a simple TikTok trend that has gone viral and found a fan in the teenage American spirit. And now it is ripping them off one viral video at a time. The question is, when will this real life game of Grand Theft Auto end? And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Norway, Finland and Sweden are holding joint military drills. It is called the Arctic Challenge 23. Personnel from 14 countries and about 150 aircraft are participating. In the United States, two chimneys were downed in Pennsylvania. Their operation was halted in April 2022. And in UK, tiger cubs went swimming for the first time in a London zoo. And finally, what makes June 7th significant? We are taking you back in history. On this day in 1975, the first ever Men's Cricket World Cup began in England. India and England played the first match of the tournament. England won the first match, but West Indies won the first ever World Cup. We leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.